everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Also consider joining my Patreon page for some cool perks. I'll leave a link in the description. Thanks for tuning in to a new episode of Rock and Read. All good things must come to an end. Today we'll read the last chapter of My Life in the Eagles by Don Felder. I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to this book even more than I've enjoyed reading it. Without further ado, why don't we find out what happens in the final chapter. I dreaded reading the official announcement of my departure from the band in black and white. When I did in a small newspaper article two weeks later, it was as if someone had taken a baseball bat and hit me in the solar plexus. Up until that moment, my attorney had still been trying to negotiate on my behalf, and I had held a small flickering candle of hope that it was all some terrible mistake and that I'd still be able to reach out to Dawn and Glenn in some way. When I saw the announcement in print, it stuck to the flypaper of my brain. I knew then that hell would never freeze over again. For months afterward, I was left gasping for breath. I walked around in a daze, wondering what the... I was supposed to do with my life. My foundations had been shaken, not just with the breakdown of my marriage, but the end of my career. Everything I had known was gone. For 29 years of my life I had been married, and for 27 years of my life I had been an eagle. I didn't know anything else. Being an eagle was my identity. To lose it felt like a bereavement, and I went into mourning for well over a year. I worried that I might collapse under the weight of my grief. Now I knew how Susan felt. I realized with humility to have had the world ripped out from under her. I suddenly missed everything about being in the band. The hours in the studio, the times on the road, the gigs, the friendships, and the fun. My mind rewound and replayed my times with them, quickly fast forwarding over all the bad stuff and the long months of hell. If I press pause and allowed myself a tiny glimpse I convinced myself that even those times would be better than this sense of utter desolation and emptiness. Catherine was an absolute godsend. I'd wake in the early hours with a panic attack and she'd comfort me. I'd sit with a cup of coffee, staring into the fireplace late into the night, wallowing in self-pity. Sometimes she'd just sit with me, her hand in mine, soaking up the silence and allowing me to cry. I felt like I was dying inside. There wasn't a single hour of my day when I didn't mourn my loss. How could they treat me so badly after all we'd been through together? I'd ask her, my throat closing around my vocal cords. Didn't I deserve better than this? I felt helpless in the face of their cruelty, their actions cutting through me like a knife. It took months and months, but very slowly, Catherine taught me how to accept what had happened and reinvent myself completely. She made me put the whole event into perspective to see that I was still extraordinarily lucky and to realize that I had to decide what I was going to do and how to rebuild my life. With her help, I tried to concentrate on the positives. Count your blessings, as my mother would say whenever I'd complain as a child about not being able to afford a new bike or a new pair of shoes. I came to see that although being an eagle hadn't been the easiest of roads, it had enabled me to have innumerable moments of pure exhilaration and unadulterated joy. I had started as the new kid in town with long blonde hair, a beard and mustache, and a brown leather jacket, driving a battered old Volvo, looking for some session work. Thanks to Bernie's generous introductions, I was a guitar player who got lucky and wound up in a band that for 30 years remained in the fast lane of Rock's Super Highway. After years of the kind of life most guitar players would give their favorite Les Paul 4, I had weathered the most savage of storms and come through unscathed. Well, maybe a little battered and graying at the edges, but I had somehow survived to tell the tale. Whatever else I had achieved, I know I helped make some great music, arguably some of the most enduring of the 20th century. It was widely agreed that my guitar playing had been a cornerstone of the Eagles' success. My defining moment had been standing on the stage in the spotlight, playing the first few chords of the best song I ever wrote. Between us, we'd made the music that a whole generation had grown up with. They had laughed and loved and lived and cried to our songs. Some of our older listeners might not be able to remember what they did yesterday, but they can still remember every word of Hotel California. We still have an estimated 100 million fans worldwide. 
But my lord, I paid my dues for the privilege. I spent years on the road away from my family, missing my wife and kids. I suffered stress-related health problems and spent sleepless drug-fed nights, wondering if it was all worth it. I endured untold emotional abuse from people who should have been my best friends. We'd been through so much. We'd laughed and loved and lived and cried to the same songs as our audience. But the bottom line is, we never really got along. I realize that now. From the first day I walked into the record plant studio, that band was breaking up. Everyone was at each other's throat, emotionally and artistically. We just never clicked the way some bands did. A self-destruct mechanism was constantly ticking away. Beneath the rigid coat of silence that hid our fractured, contentious side from the public and allowed our mythical, peaceful, easy image to continue, our dream of stardom and togetherness slowly morphed into a Hotel California-style nightmare. Terrified of speaking out in case I made things worse, my years of acquiescence meant that I could check out, but I could never leave. I can remember looking at other bands like Chicago or U2 and envying their unqualified camaraderie. Those bands were like brothers. They not only got along well with each other on stage and in the studio, they socialized together, went on vacation with each other, and babysat each other's kids. Where was the love like that in the Eagles? It never existed. We might as well have been a group of session musicians who had never met and didn't give a about anything but the music, putting our heads together to create a sound and then going our respective ways. To some of us, money came before friendship at every turn. The minute we came off tour, no one called each other or went over to another's house to say, hey, wasn't that great? There we were, blessed with this amazing success that should have brought us to our knees with gratitude and humility, hailed as the greatest band America had ever produced, but instead of reveling in every moment of it, sharing the joy of this charmed existence with each other and our families, we were too busy tearing each other apart. As Timothy sang in his haunting song, I Can't Tell You Why, we made it harder than it had to be. Our American dream was systematically destroyed by egos and perfectionism and greed. We worried away at each other like the tip of a tongue on a sore tooth. Then after years of loyal service, of putting up with all the crap, the gods told me my services were no longer required. That really hurt. Although we'd never clicked socially, after all those years of being thrown together in the most bizarre and extreme of circumstances, these guys were closer than family. Hell, they were my family. I now know that they had to get rid of me because I was asking too many awkward business questions and was about to expose them for what they were. I guess they've been busy with the shredders ever since. Well, alright, so be it. In a way, it came as a horrible relief. I was damned if I was just going to walk away from the legacy I'd helped to create though. After years of being bro beaten into submission, I was finally going to stand up for what I believed. Three people owned Eagles LTD. Don Henley, Glenn Fry, and Don Felder. We own the rights to the name The Eagles, including the right to use that name on record or on tour, and the right to license it for use on merchandise. There was a major difference between my so-called departure and that of Bernie and Randy. I never quit, and I never surrendered or offered up my shares of stock. According to our corporate agreement, which is still valid, someone had to leave of his own volition for that to happen. They couldn't just boot me out of the company, then try to buy my shares back at whatever price they deemed fair. Their offer was both arrogant and misguided. It also made me realize what I had to do. In February of 2001, I filed a lawsuit against Eagles LTD in the California Superior Court, Los Angeles. I had two choices, to tuck my tail between my legs and walk away, or to fight back. For way too long, I had walked away. Now Don, Glenn, and Irving had given me no choice. My attorney assured me that I had a very strong case of wrongful termination and breach of contract. Judging from past experience, Don and Irving, no strangers to litigation, would fight at first, but then settle. My final suit alleged involuntary dissolution of Eagles LTD, breach of implied, in fact, employment contract, wrongful termination, violation of public policy, breach of fiduciary responsibility, and breach of written contract, and sought full accounting and declaratory relief. The wording of the suit claimed that Glenn and Don treated me as a hired hand for much of my time with the band and used threats to intimidate me. By the time my lawyers had finished, I was effectively demanding a complete accounting of 
every single business transaction by Eagles LTD since 1974, including record royalties and revenue from touring and merchandising in accordance with the contract I signed in 2000, which gave me direct, free, and independent rights to examine the books. Further, I sought all outstanding monies owed to me, a fair market price for my shares in Eagles-related companies, plus attorney's fees and court costs. In a second later lawsuit, I named Eagles LTD and Don and Gwen's new companies, NEA, Eagles Touring Company, Eagles Merchandising, Eagle Recording Company, and other companies as defendants. I also demanded a declaration confirming that I would retain my share of Eagles LTD since I didn't quit and didn't voluntarily walk away from it. That lawsuit stated, despite each being a one-third owner of Eagles LTD, Henley and Fry have consistently treated Feldner as a subordinate. With complete disregards for his rights, they have consistently voted as a block on business decisions and implemented these decisions whether or not Felder objected. They repeatedly abused their authority and acted unfairly toward Felder and former band members Meisner and Whedon. This contract has, almost without exception, been coupled with constant threats that if Felder did not agree with Henley and Fry, Felder would be thrown out of the band. And as the final straw, they terminated his employment with Eagles LTD by way of an invalid and sham board of directors meeting. After years of taking advantage of Felder, Henley and Fry now seek to cause Eagles LTD to terminate him in order to force Felder out of the band and to deprive him of his financial interest and rights in Eagles LTD. Don and Glenn's attorneys countered, The action of terminating Felder's relationship with the band was taken because it was in the best interest of the Eagles. The Eagles had every legal right to do so, and any claim by Felder to the contrary is completely without any merit. We don't feel it's appropriate to litigate the case in the press. The case will be determined in court, and we're confident that the position of the Eagles will be fully vindicated. In March 2001, a month after my departure, the Recording Industry Association of America officially announced the Eagles as the third best-selling band in the U.S. after the Beatles and Led Zeppelin. Electra rated our sales as in excess of 83 million units. During formal dispositions for my pending court case in early 2002, I sat alone giving testimony opposite Irving, who winked at me across the table shortly after being asked to leave the room as he wasn't a party in the lawsuit. It was an intimidating experience for anyone. Strangely, though, I enjoyed every minute of it. It was as if my whole life had groomed me for that moment. Every answer I gave felt strong and proud and true. Staring Glenn in the eye, I described what it was like to be bullied and battered and abused. To every tough question, I had an answer. My long silence was finally over, and having found my voice, I wanted to shout from the rooftops. From the day I first went to court, Don and Gwen deprived me of my rightful share of profits generated by the Eagles. The irony is that Don is still a spokesman for artists' rights, and on recent tours, some of the money raised went to the Recording Artists Coalition. The trial day was set for September 2006, and a settlement was finally reached. Emerging from the darkest period of my life and recovering my senses enough to focus on my future, I realized that my life stretched unfinished before me. I began to work on a new solo project, the key word of which was fun. Never again would I allow myself to be a pawn in somebody else's mind game. When it's done, I expect it to be full of screaming, guitar-driven tracks, melding the two generations and representing the passing of the baton from the senior to the junior players. The Eagles went back into the studio, resurrecting Bill Seismic to produce their first new studio album together since 1979, and the first without me. Six years on, there was still no album. There's not a lot of socializing going on, Don tellingly admitted to one magazine. In another interview, he said, Things don't really change that much, you know? People don't change that much. They just become more who they really are. Just as in the old days, to buy some time, they embarked on some short tours instead, playing all the old classics. They never replaced me, just hired a sideman to play all my guitar parts. For three decades, the money-making enigma that the Eagles became had been able to keep our worldwide legion of fans in the dark about our inner workings. They maintained a relentlessly positive image, almost as crucial to the band's success as its music. I was there every step of the way. And ending my silence and giving the first brutally honest account of what it was really like to be in one of the greatest but perhaps one of the most contentious rock bands of all time, I'm not seeking revenge, only to redress the balance for me, Bernie, and Randy.
I've learned a great many things, not least that family and friends come before money. You have to stand up for what you believe in, and for too long, I didn't. That is my only regret. Some might say that only the lawyers emerge winners from such protected lawsuits as ours. Maybe. But the time had come for wrongs to be righted, and I was determined to fight for justice for the sake of my kids, who sacrificed a great deal by having a dad in the Eagles. I know I've had incredibly good fortune. I joined a band that was blessed with phenomenal success. Despite everything, I'll always cherish what we achieved and remember with great fondness the good times we shared. The lust for money and power ultimately destroyed us. Egos got in the way of music. It happens in many businesses, not just this one, but rarely has it happened in the arts and in such a spectacularly disastrous or contentious way. Looking at Randy and Bernie, I know we're better off for being away from the band. Each of us has found himself in the freedom of life beyond the Eagles. Randy is remarried and divides his time between Palm Springs and L.A. He's had modest success with his three solo albums and has formed a hard-hitting rock and roll band called World Classic Rockers featuring musicians from Steppenwolf, Toto, and Van Halen, which had a lot of fun touring the clubs and corporate gigs of America. Bernie, who contributed so much to the Eagles and wrote their first top 10 hit, Witchy Woman, is happily settled in Franklin, Tennessee, near Nashville, where he lives with his son. After years of being a performer, session man, songwriter, and producer working with the greats, he became a ball player turned manager and is vice president of A&R Pioneer Music Group. We have remained in touch over the years, on the phone and by email, and shall always be friends. To this day, if any of the band members asked me to play with them, I would. I'd even step up and play alongside Glenn. I suspect Randy and Bernie would too. After all these years, those guys still feel like family to me. Like family members, you don't always get along with all the time. The physical connection is there, underpinning everything. It's thicker than water, they say. We shed enough blood, sweat, and tears in the three decades we spent together, and our ties are strong. Despite the inevitable sadness of the litigation against my former band members, we have a unique history together that's even stronger than the bitterness the recriminations, and the addictive compulsion to make a dollar. The future for me has never looked brighter. I'm fed in good health and have the love of a good woman. My children are thriving. Lee is about to embark on a career as a singer thanks to Patrick Swayze's mother Patsy, who runs a singing school, and the legendary vocal coach Joel Ewing, who set aside his usual rule against teaching children when he heard her voice. Cody is a brilliant percussionist working as a writer and producer in Boston, having attended the Berkeley College of Music a few blocks from where Susan and I used to live. He still has his rebellious streak and prefers bands like Rage Against the Machine to the Eagles, but he's doing just fine. Rebecca, who's always been such a sweet-natured girl, has taken over the running of Susan's jewelry design business. Jesse, my eldest son, now has two kids and runs his own successful financial management company in Oregon. My divorce from Susan finally came through in early 2002 after months of litigation and negotiation, which we eventually resolved through mediation. We sold the house, the plane, and all the rest of my property, and I gave her half of everything I owned, plus her business, without contest. I tried in every way I could to make that part of the process as painless as possible. My attitude was to lose a few dollars but save a few tears. She still gets 50% of all my income from the Eagles and has received half of what I was awarded by the eventual settlement. My lord, she's entitled to it. As a bonus, I threw in wings. She had always loved that boat, even more than I did. I gave it to her with the message, May you have sunny skies and calm waters. We had been together through all the tough years and only broke up right at the end. Our marriage lasted roughly the same amount of time as my union with the Eagles. We stayed together all that time, not only because we truly loved each other and had four young kids, but also because our parents never divorced. Susan suffered minute by minute and day by day at my side, and she was as much a part of the Eagles as I was. She knew what went on, and yet she forgave me. I guess in the end, we spent so much time apart that we couldn't hack it together anymore. We had four beautiful children together, she told me during the immediate aftermath of the divorce. We're going to see each other at weddings and births and funerals. For the sake of the kids, it would be great if we can at least get along. The sooner we can arrive at that place together, the happier everyone will be. We eventually accepted that, and we're fine. She's had a couple new relationships since, and I wish her every happiness. When I'm not enjoying my new life with Catherine, I spend my spare time having lunch or playing golf with friends like Randy Meisner, living a very low-key life in L.A. 
I travel to Europe as much as possible. I enjoy the time I have with my grandchildren and look forward to having more. I don't live my days in the gossip columns, and I still don't squander money. I can walk down Sunset Boulevard and most of the time not be recognized. I have a good life. Most of all, I'm looking forward to getting back out on the road and playing music again, promoting the new album, and working on other similar projects in the coming years. There are other singers-slash-songwriters besides Don Henley and Glenn Fry. All I ever wanted to do, and what I came to California for, was to make music. Music is in my blood. My father first fostered it in the days when I used to plug my guitar into the television set and make up the soundtrack for Mighty Mouse cartoons, and with his encouragement, I never lost that passion. I'm not exactly sure which direction I'm going to point the compass on my bow of my boat after this, but it will undoubtedly involve music. It's not as if I have a choice. Although I didn't realize it at the time, my last performance with the Eagles was on December 31st, 1999 at the Staples Center in Los Angeles as part of the Millennium Celebrations. It truly was the eve of a new dawn. I didn't give my finest performance. We've all played a lot better at various times over the past three decades. Despite my ill health and the divisions that were tearing us apart, we put on a show that seemed to satisfy those who had paid so much money to hear us play. Glenn was right, bringing our unique mix of country, bluegrass, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, soul, Dixieland, and folk to the band from all parts of America, we somehow came up with a cinematic soundtrack to a generation. Sonic wallpaper, someone once called it. More than that, the music we'd played had been the soundtrack of our own lives. Every song we'd worked so slavishly over had its own secret story. Every guitar riff, drum track, and vocal had been agonized over. We all had our own favorites, songs that struck a chord with us as well as the fans. For me, Hotel California represents the pinnacle of my music career. As I stood on that stage beneath those crystal chandeliers and heard the roar of the crowd as I played the opening bars of the song I had made my own, I knew that whatever else happened in my life, this was as good as it gets. In my fevered brain, I closed my eyes and swayed in time to the chords I had ridden that golden day in Malibu. For a moment, I was back in my childhood bedroom, standing alone under a single red light bulb, playing for all I was worth. Or on the stage of the State Theater, my shirt sticking to my back with fear as I hammered out Adventure's classic. Mine had been a remarkable journey. All of ours had. Here we were, the most successful American band of the century, televised to the world for thousands of people who, like us, wondered what the new millennium would bring. Behind me, the hands of the giant clock moved inexorably toward midnight. My fingers straining under the pressure of the complicated chords, I belted out the music I loved and allowed my mind to drift momentarily beyond all the petty bickering and the jealousy and the rivalry, which had, in its own way, I knew, helped to make us great. It was a blessing and a curse. The price we had to pay for our genius. For now, I wanted to forget all that, to soar away on the dark desert highway. Against all odds, we'd made it. At the start of the 21st century, we were still together and still in California, taking it to the limit one last time. In March 2007, my mother passed away. She was 91 years old and on her way home from church on a beautiful Florida morning. I went home to Gainesville to help Jerry bury her. The entire family flew in from the service and we had a wonderful get-together recounting her life in photographs and sharing stories of her childhood. Walking around in my past filled me with a childish sense of wonder. I went to the Palm Meadows where Leonard Gideon and I used to play forts. In the swamp pond where I was nearly bitten by a water moccasin. I searched in vain for Irene Cooter's chinaberry tree, which must have been cut down long before. I took some photographs of the house I grew up in. It's still standing, a testament to my father's remarkable building skills. I couldn't believe how small it was. Two bedrooms with a bathroom in between and two rooms downstairs. All Luis windows have long since been replaced. A battered Dodge was parked in the driveway instead of Dad's old Chevy. Some other young family lives in it now, and I wondered as I watched their kids playing noisily in the backyard that my mother had us grade so painstakingly, if they had air conditioning for the sweltering summer nights or something better than the kerosene heater in the winter. I like to think I've made my peace with my father before he died. I might not have become a lawyer like my brother Jerry, but being in one of the most successful rock groups in the world proved to him, I hope, that I had done something valid with my life after all. 
He might never have acknowledged it with me, but he knew from my mom and Jerry how well I had done. The older I get, the more I appreciate just how much of an influence Dad was. From the first time he plugged me into his voice and music machine, or bought me the gold Fender music maker from the daughter of a guy at the plant. I now know how much we really meant to one another, even if we never got around to telling each other. I've come to realize that despite all the fighting we did for all those years, it was never really wasted time. Turning to leave and heading back to the brand new car I'd rented to drive out to our old house, I caught sight of my own reflection in the glass of the driver's window. Staring back at me was a smiling, tanned, middle-aged man in sunglasses standing in the dappled sunlight in front of a small and unremarkable building. I wasn't much younger than my father was when he died, and yet I was glowing with good health, having avoided a life of hard labor fixed machinery at the local plant. My hands instinctively went to my hair. It wasn't as short as he might have wanted it to be, but it was cotton white, well-groomed, and a few inches above the collar line. I think Dad would have been pleased. Well, that's the end of the last chapter and the book. Overall, I thought My Life in the Eagles was an excellent book, and I would definitely read it again. What are your thoughts on the book? Let me know in the comments. Before I go, I want to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon, Matt and Stacy from Canada. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.